Friends, over the past couple of years, you and I have been very fortunate to drive a number of cars from the fine folks over at Aufrecht, Mircea und Grossersbach. But today we're going to go on a bit of a journey. Today we're going to find out what happens when you take an almost 600 horsepower car with some sort of an origami thing for a roof and then graft on an old hot rod trick. Now over the past six years, you and I have driven a lot of Mercedes-Benz and AMG cars. So invariably, we're going to get to the point where we're going to drive an engine we've driven before, just in a different handy carrying case. Uh, and it, you know, we've had this problem, if you could call it, really it's more like deja vu over in the Volkswagen Audi group side of things where we've driven that two liter direct injected, uh, what is it, EA, triple eight, four cylinder engine like 85 times recently. Uh, well, I would say this, this is a better problem or deja vu to have because this is a 5.5 liter twin turbo V8 and it puts out, there's really no way to put this comical numbers. It's 577 horsepower, which comes in at 5,500 RPM. And then the torque, that's really where the comedy begins. It's 664 pound-feet of torque, which comes in at 2,250 RPM, stays flat all the way up to 3,750 RPM. And as a basis of comparison, as you're letting that kind of roll through your brain, that mini Cooper, Clubman, Countryman, whatever thing we drove, um, that was a four-cylinder, so half the cylinders, but 207 pound-feet of torque. So this, with double the cylinders, is more than triple the torque. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Now, uh, this is, as we've talked about in the tech review, this is a mid-cycle refresh, and the engine is kind of a carryover, and this one is hand-built by La Rosa Massimo. Doesn't really sound German, now does it? Uh, anyway, there is actually a technical change, but it's more with the Catriba, the transmission, than it is the engine. So for the avoidance of doubt, in the SL63, the transmission is a DCT, unlike the SL65, the 12-cylinder, which is a torque converter, but they're both seven speeds. Uh, but what the AMG engineers did is they've made the shifts faster. So putting together the comical carryover numbers with the revised transmission, how does that all translate out to the road? Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little louder here because we got a lot of wind noise, pulling power, pushing power, however you want to call it. We got a nice steep grade here to kind of give this thing a test because are you really expecting this thing to be slow? So comfort mode, which is the basic mode of that dynamic setting, foot down. Ah, uh, yeah. I'd say pulling power, pushing power, check. Okay, so now that we're at the top of the hill, let's switch to sport mode, downshift, put our foot into it as we go around a turn here. And yeah, the throttle mapping changes, but you know what? Well, let's try something different because you and I have driven a lot of Mercedes Benz with this like dynamic control thingamajig thing here. Um, so let's just skip Sport Plus completely because there is a reason. Uh, there is race mode. I know I'm trying to demonstrate pulling power, or pushing power, whatever you want to call it, but let's downshift, slow down a little bit, and check this out. Oh, ho, ho, ho. it's got the burble. We love the burble. Now we can put this thing in a manual transmission only mode so it'll let us bounce off the red line. Which means you can burble it some more. So I was talking to one of the engineers yesterday and he was telling me, yes, yeah, so we made some changes and did this. But really, one of the things he was most excited about was the exhaust. It's now louder in, a, in like in a politically correct time. And this car, it ain't politically correct. <laughs> they make it even more obnoxious. So driving dynamics. One of the most obvious things on this specific car are the carbon ceramic rotors that are fitted as optional. Uh, but there are some other things in the change from 16 to 17 that actually affect driving dynamics, uh, not just the look of the car, and that is the body panels. Uh, so the body panels, all of them now are aluminum, which lower the weight of the overall car, really the body itself, by about a couple hundred pounds, maybe 200 pounds. Uh, then, uh, I would like to say this is a trick that is stolen from my beloved Lotus, and we've talked about this 
in many other cars because it's kind of a trend as everyone's going to lightweighting, and that is using bonding and adhesion in the construction method of the car. Uh, but then there is one thing that I am particularly excited about, and that is an old school, like hot rod kind of mechanical diff not an electronic diff that like actuates the brakes when you don't want it like on the inside wheel or something like that no it is an old school mechanical diff that like your grandfather fitted to his like buick special that he used to race on the weekends for like pink slips or whatever it was is now on the back of a mercedes-benz sl63 amg so putting that all together with aluminum body panels and, and carbon ceramic rotors and glue how does that affect driving time Oh, oh, listen to that echo. As cool as that is, it's time for us to do some driving dynamics. Now, if you have watched us drive Mercedes over the years, we've gone through like a soup of names like ABC, Magic Body Control, whatever the hell you want to call these different names. Uh, this car does have ABC in it, which means it controls the pitch, squat, dive, and roll a bit here. Now granted, like we can go down to comfort mode here, and yes, it'll be more like a GT, but at, believe it or not, in this mode, it's not as softly sprung as like the SL550 or the SL450. But now if we switch to sport mode, actually forget it, let's go to sport plus, because we did, we skipped sport plus in the uh, pulling power segment. Let's go around this turn a little bit faster. There's, there's a little bit of roll onto the back wheel, but not a huge amount. Okay, now let's switch to race mode. We got a nice left-hand sweeper here. Pick up our speed. Please don't try this at home. Downshift, get some speed into here. And people, this is a 4,800 pound car. You shouldn't be doing this with such a big GT. And I gotta tell you, like that diff, I was able to cut that turn so much sharper than previous SLs I've driven. That, it's noticeable. And really that's what a mechanical diff is for, is to help you out on the inside wheel. And what's so beautiful about a mechanical diff, you don't feel like that feathering of the brake, that's effectively what e-diffs do. Now granted, there are some other e-diffs, like in the Lexus, it's got that special, almost kind of like, hybrid diff in the back. Like Yaguchi-san took some technology from his hybrids and put it into the diff of the RCF. With this, it, God, it's such a refreshing change. Let's try it again. And we're still in race mode. Let's downshift. We got a nice turn coming up here. You know what? The biggest difference is composure. So much more composure. And that's saying, an incredible amount of information on such a big car, because it's not just 4,800 pounds, it's 4,800 pounds and a long wheelbase. Now, one other thing we need to cover before we press on from driving dynamics is let's downshift again. I know I feel like I've been doing a lot of downshifting with you guys. Um, the transmission, the engineers were telling me the transmission shifts faster. Gotta be honest with you, I don't notice a huge difference here. And I think that's just a function of the size and weight of the vehicle kind of mask any improvement you would have from a faster transmission. So I had the good fortune of having dinner uh, with Chris Rhodes last night. He is the chief designer of Mercedes-Benz US design studio here in Carlsbad, not far from where we are now. Fascinating guy because he's been with Mercedes for like 28 years. He literally graduated Art Center and then booked a trip to Germany for a week to interview with Ford, GM, BMW, and Mercedes. Actually, it was a friend of the family that was like uh, an exchange student when he was growing up, now back in Germany, that got him a job. An interview with Bruno Sacco, the then chief designer of Mercedes-Benz, and basically they wouldn't let him leave Germany in that week until he agreed to take the job at Mercedes. So here we are 28 years later talking about this car. Uh, anyway, I've always said that you don't buy a car, you buy a story. Well, there's your story. Anyway, uh, so remember the GLA 45, uh, we talked about the night package. Uh, well, guess what has the night package now, including these cool black mirror housings? Now, as part of this whole like 2017 mid-cycle refresh, it's not just the front end, it's also different side skirts, which in the night package are black. Uh, now, put that aside because you and I, we love details 
but we love mechanical stuff even more. And um, windshield wipers. It's all windshield wipers these days, right? Well, have you ever been in a convertible and you had to clean the windshield? Basically, while the windshield gets cleaned, you get a shower. Uh, so what the engineers did is like, okay, well, why don't we, during the sweep, have the wiper fluid come out on both sides of the wiper, both up and down, so this way you don't get a shower. That's a very interesting detail. But there is one other detail that isn't changed, thankfully, is when you move up to an AMG, the clock on the dash goes from no name like store brand to IWC von Schaffhausen. Okay, now you and I are at the very difficult point of the episode where we have to put aside carbon ceramic brakes and 664 pound-feet of torque and talk about UX. Because this car is a first here on the show. It's not the first AMG, not by a long shot. It's the first Mercedes-Benz that we have had with Apple CarPlay. Uh, right now you can't see it because it's in the Mercedes UX, which we have seen with the menu up here and the menu up here. And this will change with the coming E-Class and we'll get to that. But take a look at this. We've got a unified controller. We move this over one, hit Apple CarPlay, and we have the ubiquitous iOS start screen. And you know, you can go through here and there's different screens depending on like how many apps you have on your device. So it works kind of the same as we've experienced in other CarPlay episodes. You should go back and check those out. It was a Ferrari and a couple of Hyundais uh, and a Cadillac and a Camaro. We actually have done a lot of these episodes, I don't think about it. But there's two major exceptions here. Uh, number one, can't touch anything. So if I want to like go to the phone or go to my podcast or music or anything, it's all through the unified controller and I am not a fan of unified controllers. It, does, it takes too much away from you when you're driving. And then number two and more importantly, the maps. Remember in the Hyundai episode, we spent a lot of time talking about how they took the decision, at least in the first version of their application, that you had to have the maps, the onboard navigation from Hyundai to get CarPlay. Well, they changed that in the Elantra, but here's the problem in this application. The, this comes with navigation from the factory, so the system from Mercedes. But when you have your Apple iOS device connected and running CarPlay, you don't have a choice. You can't go in to the Mercedes UI and choose the map. It's not even available. You have radio, Apple CarPlay, or vehicle, and that's it. So if you want to use the maps, you actually have to go, and you want CarPlay, you have to go and use the map from the iOS device. But here's the problem. I have virtually no coverage, which means I have no map. So in summary, what do we got? Well, I've spent some time after driving this car uh, to find an eloquent way to put this, and really there is no eloquent way to put this. Uh, this car, a frickin' weapon. A more refined weapon, but still a weapon nonetheless. And that is all a function of that uh, mechanical diff in the rear. Yeah, there's all these wonderful changes that make it prettier and that kind of stuff, but we need to put that aside because really what the mechanical diff does is it takes a 4,800 pound GT car, remember this ain't a sports car, and it increases its limits of adhesion in places you really shouldn't take a car like this. Like some of the turns we went on today, uh, you couldn't do that with the previous one. Um, and please don't try that at home. But it does present an incredibly I'd say important question, because really, this is not a cheap car. Figure, what, 150, 160, the way this one's equipped. Uh, that gives you a lot of choices of what you could buy. Do you want this specific tool, which is a very, very fast car, but more of a GT, more of a luxury car, or for the same money, do you want something like a 911 that is more of a scalpel for the job? So I'm gonna turn this question around to you guys. If you had a budget of, let's say, 150 to 200,000, what car would you choose? Would it be an SL63 AMG, or would it be something like a 911? I'm not saying you can only choose a 911. There are many other choices in that price range. So here's the very specific question. What would you choose? Why would you choose it? What region of the world you live in? And what car do you currently drive? Let me know in the comments below, or via our social media, Motoman TV one word, Motoman TV one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I want to leave you with two things. Number one, make sure you download our fancy new mobile application, which you can get for free from Apple iTunes or Google Play. And number two, maybe, just maybe, there might be another Mercedes-Benz SL episode coming up after this one. Uh, you'll have to wait to find out. But until then, fish beta.